Rupert, I've been obsessed with the nature of reality my whole life, and I've really been looking forward to speaking with you because your sense of reality is a little bit broader than other people's. Than some people's, right. yes. How, do you, how, how so? What are some of your ideas? Um, it's hard to know where to begin with <laughs> such a general question. Um, well, let's take a really big view. I think that the universe is evolutionary. Most people think that. The entire cosmos is evolutionary. And I think that the rules that govern it, the laws that govern it, are evolutionary too. A lot of people think that we have an evolving universe, but at the moment of the Big Bang, all the laws of nature were there fully formed, like a cosmic Napoleonic code. Um, I don't think it's like that at all. I think the laws evolve along with nature. And in fact, I think the term law is a really bad term for them, because law implies a human legal system. It's a human metaphor. It's very anthropocentric. I think a much better term is habit. So my view is that the universe evolves, and with it, the habits of nature. And the so-called laws of nature are really just habits that have become so habitual, they behave as if they're fixed. Um, so I think that the world is radically evolutionary. Uh, evolution permeates the entire fabric of the universe. Um, it's not just confined to the biological realm or the early phases of the Big Bang. Um, it's the way the world is. So it's radically evolutionary, it's full of habits, and also creative, because evolution depends both on repetition, which is what habits do, and creativity, uh, which is where new things come from. If you just had just habits, nothing would change. If you had just creativity, you'd have a kind of chaos of innovation with nothing stabilizing. So I think the universe is an interplay of habit and creativity, and I think this is reflected all through nature. What are some of the exemplifications of that or implications? Well, examples would be if you make a new chemical compound um, that's never been made before, as far as we know, that's something new in nature. If you crystallize it, that's a new form in nature. Those crystals have never exist existed before. This is done all the time. Thousands of new chemicals are made every year in universities and drug companies. So when the crystal first forms, it hasn't got a habit. Um, and it's actually rather hard to get crystals to form for the first time. People have to wait months or years, and no one quite knows how to get them to form. You just have to wait sometimes. Anyway, you've got, you get a crystal sooner or later, and then it gets easier all around the world to crystallize these things on the whole. Uh, chemists have known this for years. Um, I would say this is a new habit getting established. The more often it's done, there's a kind of memory of, of the previous crystals. So your vision is, is that somehow making that first crystal uh, embodies that form in some super field sense, as opposed to just the common human ability to do things because other people have, they read about it, and they learn how to do it better and better. That's right. I think that once the new form has become established, it's a new fact in nature, a new habit becomes established in nature. And through repetition, it gets more habitual. So what I'm saying is if you make new crystals in one place, like Oxford, then it should get easier to make the same crystals all around the world, even if you don't tell the people there how to do it. Even if you don't take fragments of these crystals to nucleate crystals somewhere else, it'll get easier everywhere just because it's happened here. There's a kind of memory in nature. And how could that possibly happen? Well, my uh, hypothesis is that it happens by a process that I call morphic resonance. Morphic resonance is the influence of similar patterns of activity on subsequent similar patterns of activity. So what's important is similarity. And this moves across space and time. So it's a kind of cumulative memory. Uh, the first time you make a new crystal, there isn't a field for it already, but it, it comes into being. The second time, it's influenced by the first crystals. The third time, it's influenced by the first and second ones. The fourth time, by the first, second, and third. So it builds up this influence by morphic resonance. So each kind of thing, each kind of crystal, each biological species, uh, uh, has a kind of collective memory on which each individual draws and to which it contributes. And these fields are universal, or are they limited to the geographic area uh, 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 where it for originally forms? No, they, 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 the hypothesis is that they, they're universal. Once they've occurred, this influence of morphic resonance can happen anywhere. And anywhere in the universe? 
I, well, I mean, obviously, we can't test no, what happens no. in distant galaxies. But theoretically. But, yeah, theoretically, yes. Um, and we can test what happens in distant galaxies by measuring the spectra of hydrogen atoms and that kind of thing, and they seem the same here. So in this case, conventional scientists, well, that's just because we've got universal laws, and I'd say it's because morphic resonance is universal. Can't really tell between them at that level. There's also a time difference when you're looking back in the universe oh, as yes. well. Uh, how, 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 what, what about time in, in these fields? Uh, is, it, is it instantaneous, or does it propagate the way every other field propagates? At the speed of light. Well, you know, it's it's hard to know what speed other fields propagate at. I mean, obviously, most things propagate at, at or below the speed of light. Yes. There is something in physics which is probably the most mysterious aspect of quantum physics, quantum entanglement Same. or non-locality, which is instantaneous. Yes. So the question is, is morphic resonance more like quantum phenomena, or is it more like regular mechanical phenomena? And so I think it's more like quantum phenomena. It may be instantaneous, but it's impossible at the moment to do any experiments to test that because there's no way of testing it that can give you measurements of the sort of, over sort of fractions of a nanosecond. I mean, you, you just can't do that. So, so these fields would be applied to any objects. Are they, do they have to be physical objects, or could they be ideas? Well, what they apply to is self-organizing systems. In other words, systems that organize themselves in nature, which would include molecules, crystals, cells, organisms, societies like bees and ant um, societies, mm. um, brains, and you know, which organize their own thoughts, and, and including ideas, yes, and cultures. What they don't apply to is things that are organized by external forces, like machines. The one thing that this doesn't fit with is machines. And that's where it differs from conventional science, which uses the machine as the primary analogy for everything. Um, machines are not self-organizing. That's why we have factories and designers and things. Um, and they're the one exception. Um, everything else in nature organizes itself. And I think that each self-organizing pattern of activity has a morphic field and a kind of collective inherent memory. So there would be very large numbers of separate morphic fields resonating in different ways, however they do that? Yes, lots of them. <laughs> so one for each kind of species, each kind of cell, each kind of cultural form. Yes, there's a huge diversity of organization in the universe. Sure. And I think that um, there's a huge diversity of fields that organize it. The fields themselves obey certain common principles, like morphic resonance and, and so forth. But what are some demonstrations of it, some ways you can test the validity of this? Because obviously this is rather unconventional. Yes, science is normally based on the idea that laws of nature are fixed and that every experiment should be repeatable anywhere at any time because the laws of nature are the same at all times and in all places. That's an assumption that's a carryover from the pre-evolutionary physics. I mean, the Big Bang Theory came in in the 1960s. This idea of the universal laws of nature, immutable, unchangeable, the same everywhere, is actually a hangover from 17th century theology, when people thought the laws of nature were ideas in the mind of God. And God was everywhere and always the same. Therefore, the laws were everywhere and always the same. It's an unspoken assumption, usually, in science. So. To test what I'm saying, the evolutionary view of nature, compared with the static view, the laws being fixed, uh, you need to compare new processes. Uh, if something new happens, uh, then I'm saying by repetition it'll get easier everywhere yes. in the world. Yes. So you have to look at new processes. Crystallization is one example. Crystallize new things, they should get easier all around the world even if you filter out dust particles and you don't tell the scientists special tips on how to do it, it yeah. should just get easier. Um, in biology, um, you should guess, get this with behavior. Teach a rat a new trick in Oxford, or better, teach hundreds of rats a new trick in Oxford, and rats of the same breed all over the world should be able to learn the same trick quicker. <laughs> There's already evidence from experiments with rats in laboratories that something like yeah. this actually happens. Um, in the human realm, teach people a new trick, a new video game, a, a, a new sports technique in surfboarding or snowboarding or something, um, and it should get easier for people to learn all around the world. 
In the human realm, it's hard to test because we've got videos and improved training methods. And so you can only really test it where you have completely standardized tests done the same over years. One example of that is IQ tests, intelligence tests. The same intelligence tests have been done for more than 50 years. Um, I would predict, in fact, I did predict um, when I first thought of this theory, mm. that people should, on average, be getting better at intelligence tests, not because they're getting smarter, but because the tests are getting easier to do, because millions of people already have done them. And that turns out to be exactly what happens. That it was discovered in the 80s and 90s that all around the world, IQ tests have been getting easier and easier, scores have been going up. Uh, a very mysterious phenomenon, named after the man who discovered it, a psychologist called Flynn, it's called the Flynn effect. Um, and I think this uh, is the kind of thing you'd expect with morphic resonance, a kind of collective memory. I, I think there could be a lot of other explanations for that. I mean, there could be people knowing the kinds of questions, training to experience, uh, helping their children to learn the kinds of analogy tests or whatever they can. I mean, I think oh, yes, well, those other explanations have, of course, been considered by psychologists. Sure. There's been a tremendous debate in the psychology literature. And everyone who's come up with an idea like that that could explain the Flynn effect has had it criticized and examined yeah. by other psychologists. And they've all proved... Uh, inadequate. I mean, Flynn himself considers it baffling. And um, so all the sort of easy explanations, better nutrition, better brain, bigger brain mm. size, uh, you know, all that kind of thing, uh, more exposure to television, less mm. exposure <laughs> to television, all these things have been considered and none of them can explain more than a small part of this effect. Mm. So it's a genuinely mysterious phenomenon that fits perfectly with a morphic resonance view. So there's really no difference between a biological phenomena, inorganic phenomena, or even a cultural phenomena, that each, each one has its expression in this, in this evolution of law. Yeah, I would say that all of nature evolves. All of nature has a kind of memory, that there's nothing special about biological phenomena that, uh, you know, in that they have a memory and so on. I think all of nature is evolutionary. You see, I think this is actually one of the crucial insights of modern science. And until the 1960s, people thought that biology evolved and human societies evolved and human thought and technology evolved. No, con no controversy about that. But they thought physics didn't evolve, that physics was always the same, the same yes. laws, the same yes. kinds of things, just going in cycles. Well, now what we've discovered is the entire universe evolves. The entire universe is evolutionary. And in that sense, it's much more biological than anyone thought mm. before. And people used to think the universe was a vast machine that just went on and on forever, slowly running out of steam, according to the second law mm -hmm. of thermodynamics. Now, the idea that it starts very small, less than the size of a head of a pin, very hot, and it expands, cools down, grows, and as it grows, new forms and structures appear. This is much more like an embryo. It's like a developing organism. Uh, it's nothing like a machine. No machine does that at all. So I think we've moved the whole of physics and the whole of science onto a kind of biological, evolutionary, developmental mm. basis. And that, I think, is a very, exciting, uh, a very exciting thing. And it completely changes the way we think about the world.